Hey guys, welcome to the LT Brings the Heat podcast. We're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler, where we talk about baseball and sports performance. With topics ranging from coaching, business, and player development, our goal is to bring you a no BS approach to development in baseball and sports performance. Hope you guys enjoy. Let's rock and roll. Hey guys, welcome to the episode of LT Brings the Heat. We're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler. Uh, we got an episode today. We're going to talk about a few subjects. Um, main thing we're going to talk about today is dealing with bad coaches. Uh, we're in the beginning stages of season up here in Indiana, uh, down in Bama. They're rocking and rolling in, in season and, and getting after it. Um, and we have conversations with athletes all the time. We have experiences and situations with coaches all the time, whether uh, you know it's a good situation or it's a bad situation. A coach is a good dude, a bad dude. Um, you know, maybe he's stuck in his ways. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about as much as we can to kind of help everybody understand like how to deal with certain uncomfortable situations with coaches. Uh, we're also going to touch on a little bit of summer ball stuff. Uh, we want to kind of give you guys some uh, background, some stuff that's going on in our worlds and some things that uh, we think is, uh, or we think is not right in the game of uh, summer baseball and, and kind of the politics and situations, but how's everything going at Bama, Adam? And everything's going great. We got the weather starting to get good again. We had a, a little spell that came through, some rain, canceled some games, but hopefully that's done and over with. We can get back to playing some baseball. I think we're in our second week of the season down here, and it's been good baseball so far. Uh, talking with Jack Creston, the owner of the Knights, the other day, and he also does scouting for the Dodgers. He said this is the most he's ever seen kids throwing 95-plus this early in the season, whether it's college or high school. And so it's crazy. I mean, we talk about it all the time on here about how these pitchers are getting better. And so our hitters got to keep up with it. And just that was confirmation of what's really going on out there. So guys that are that are off to those great starts, let's keep it up and keep it rolling. But I know you guys are about to get started up here soon. What's kind of the schedule going forward for your high school athletes? When do they start? When's their first game? So they will start practice officially. They have official practice. I believe it's March 14th. I'm sitting here. Look at the schedule real quick. Yeah, it's uh, – or sorry, March 15th. So they are finishing up their last – like I think they're allowed two workouts uh, per week right now in Indiana. Um, so they're finishing up those these the next two weeks. Um, and then within that week, they have their first uh, practice game or, or like scrimmage. And then after a week after that, essentially within two weeks, they're starting their season. So it's pretty crazy and fast up here in Indiana. So the guys that are just now – like we were talking about the other day – the guys that are just not getting into it, it's going to be an interesting start for some people because, you know, guys that haven't been taking care of their arms or are doing things the right way, they need to make sure they're doing those things right now because it happens real fast. In Indiana, it's basically April and May is for our high school seasons. That's pretty much it. And then June for the guy, the teams that really travel long in the state tournament. Um, but how many games – like we play about 28 games in our, our, our game schedule up here in Indiana. That If we're lucky, that's with weather. Sometimes we're playing in snowstorms and stuff. But like – how many games do you guys play in the high school level down there? Yeah, I want to say I'm not 100% sure, but I would imagine anywhere from 30s to mid 30s, somewhere in that area. And then I think the playoffs will kind of kick off. So that also takes into effect, like you mentioned, cancellations and stuff like that. I know they're really strict on getting those area games in. Now, if it, kind of an out of area game gets canceled, they may not make it up. It kind of just depends what their schedule is going to look like. So I think around low to mid 30s is where they really start at. And, uh, then as they make their run deep into the playoffs, you can run into some more games if you're lucky enough, if you're good enough. One thing I want to hit on is uh, those that have been listening, we had the road to 100. And so, so far with our season getting started, I think we're up to number 10 now on our home runs that we're chasing this year. So I'm excited when Sean's guys get started in their season. We're going to keep trying to post videos, keep posting them that and see where we are. I mean, we're a tenth of the way already, and I think we're two weeks into the season. So I'm super excited about getting to this 100 and then also keeping track with all the athletes and we'll give them shout outs and stuff when they're, when they're reaching their goals. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's starting to drop bombs at high Sir heat the first couple of weeks getting after it. Yeah. We, uh, we're excited to see guys going. Um, I, guys are, guys are really excited with the season coming because you know, you get, you get that cage swing and you're like, Oh man, I've been really working all off season. And like, man, I want to get outside and get after it. We had, we had one sixty degree day the other day and I know a lot of teams went outside and practice for the first time. So it's going to be fun, man, especially last year with so many kids getting kind of screwed out of their seasons with COVID. So uh, it's nice to see Texas opening up and, and Mississippi opening up. Hopefully everybody's uh, is not too far behind so these families can watch their kids play some baseball and some softball here soon. Yep, but for sure, let's get after it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when it comes to uh, summer baseball, we've had a couple episodes where we've kind of touched on some things. 
um, you know, Adam, with you guys getting ready for nights, like kind of what's, what's your role right now uh, as you guys are prepping for, for summer ball? Like how is like your, your practice and kind of your schedule mixed up now with, with high school starting? Like, do you guys kind of take a back seat with some of your older kids and, you know, is there any kind of uh, update on how everything's going with the Knights? Yes. Yeah, so they'll all take a back, a back seat right now. And I think a big thing to hit on, like while we're on this is like all these rosters and stuff get set. I think our rosters came out a couple, like two weeks ago, maybe. So like, we're still getting questions from parents that maybe don't know as much about it as like, Hey, can I try out for the teams or Hey, how do I get on a team? And like, we tell these parents is like, these tryouts usually happen in August at the end of the summer. And then they may do one like in December to kind of get ready for the spring going forward. So those that aren't, that aren't aware of it right now, so really do your research on this because that's really when your tryouts are, you have to get prepared for this stuff so they can set the schedule, set the rosters, set the hotels, all that kind of stuff. So right when your high school season ends, you can transition over to your summer ball. It's not one of those, well, we ended in May, and now what are we going to do? Oh, let's go try out for this team. Like these teams are already made, unfortunately. So those that missed out on it this year, just really challenge yourself to keep up to date on all the social media they put out and really try to track and show interest in doing this. And some parents I know will complain about, man, I've got to – pay all this money up front and I haven't even got to play a game. I don't know what team I'm on or anything like that. And it's just the way it is because otherwise a lot of people drop off left and right. If they think they're on a team, they're not supposed to be on. Uh, maybe it's something that doesn't go their way. I think one thing in this world is like commitment isn't what it used to be anymore. Uh, unfortunately you'll lose players like we have talked about before to other organizations. And there's some nasty organizations out there that poach players from, from different teams and they'll approach them through social media or they'll message the kid and, hey, man, I really would like you to come play for my team, and this is what I'm willing to offer you. And they're almost offering, like, free hotel stay or free travel money to come play. And it's just getting out of hand. It's ridiculous of, like, to try to have to police all of that stuff. Like, that's not in it. And parents, if you're allowing this to happen, like, you're setting the tone like we talk about all the time anyways. Like, know what is right, what is wrong, just simple values. And if somebody's coming to you because they want your kid, I promise you that probably the team they're with now wants your kid too. They're just not going to come re-recruit you because you're already on their team. Like they, they love and care about you just as much. It's just they're not going out of their way to be like, hey, we should you should come play for us because we can offer you the, all this extra stuff or you'll get to come play shortstop for us. So if you're getting approached by a, a organization, a coach or somebody in that organization about – hey, we'd really like you to come try out to us. Like, number one, look back. Are you happy where you are? If you are, then right away, just ignore it. If there is some issues, maybe reach out to that organization you're with and be like, hey, these are a little concerns. Can I just kind of prick your brain on it before? We don't want to jump ship. We just kind of want to see where we stand or where my kid stands going into this career of his baseball development standpoint. But you just got to do research on your own and, like, really understand that just because a coach is coming after your kid doesn't mean the coach he's already with doesn't want him. I think a lot of these kids are loving that feeling of being recruited almost of, man, this feels good to be wanted. We all know that it does feel really good to be wanted, but just know there's some nasty organizations out there that they don't like each other and they try to go behind each other's back to make things happen. And they're going to tell you everything that you want to hear they're not going to tell you hey come play for us and then you're going to bat last no they're going to tell you what you want to hear so to get you to jump ship and more times than not the people that i've known that have done this have regretted it ever since but you also burn bridges doing that too so you've got to understand if you're willing to make the sacrifice like there's no way in heck you can come back a year later saying hey we kind of messed up is there any way you can take us back because that organization you left, they're going to remember that kind of stuff. So I know you've been in a lot longer with the Indiana Bulls organization. Just what are kind of some of the things, like how are y'all transitioning over number one from high school and then the summer stuff? But then like what are some stories out there maybe or just how to approach this whole travel baseball world that has really blown up the past few years? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's amazing how much it changes from year to year when it comes to travel baseball and, and just it's – I can remember when we were just playing Thursday through Sundays and, you know, now scheduling wise, it's, it's Wednesday to and sometimes Tuesday through Sundays. Um, I don't know how some of these parents make money in the summertime with all the travel. And we were joking about that the other day, but I'm just like, yep. you know, with the cost it, it, it is to play travel baseball on top of the amount of time that it takes in the summer. It's pretty crazy, but I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, I'll, I'll, to kind of touch on the schedule, like uh, once official practice starts for high school, we won't be able to have any kind of session with any of our guys until after the first round of sectionals, which is the playoffs up here in Indiana, the first round of playoffs, uh, the teams, that, the players that lose, then we can actually uh, get them together and play. Most of the time we'll combine with our white team 
uh, for the first tournament because we'll be on such a small amount of guys. I mean, there's been seasons that first weekend we'll have like seven guys, <laughs> and so I'll need to I'll need to pick up some uh, guys. And the POs love it though because the POs are like, I get some ABs this weekend. So, yep. uh, but you know, it, you're so right on the fact that loyalty is just it's 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 kind of a unicorn word nowadays, and it's just. For me, it's very upsetting uh, because, you know, the examples that parents, examples that uh, tribal baseball organizations are sending for these kids is allowing them to act the way that they act uh, and make the decisions they make. You know, for me, and I, and I love I love it when I shake a hand of a father or I shake the hand of a kid, a uh, young man. I say, I, 17 years old, I'm treating him like a young man. And they say, hey, I'm going to play for you. And I know, boom, that's like that right there, that handshake, that's like a contract. That's a, that's a man-to-man thing. They're going to look me in the eye. They're going to play for me. Well, the last two years, I've had two groups of parents and two players that shook my hand and then went and played for and chose to play for another uh, ball club. And to me, like that's, you know, that's a really, really, really bad situation when we have parents. And what I found out is that the parents are shopping their kids around and they're trying to find scholarships. They're trying to find free rides and, you know, they're like, hey, you know, you know, what, what are you going to do for me? Uh, what are you going to do for me? And I heard a story of a dad a couple of years ago um, that was like, hey, I will take my entire travel, like the best players in my travel team. So he had a travel, he had a certain team and he had like five, six legit D1 dudes. He's like, I'll take them all over if you let me be pitching coach and I have to make all the pitching changes and stuff. And I'm just like. Dude, that's just and 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 from that coach, he told me he's like, no, dude, that's not how we play. We're not doing those things. And so he 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 did the right thing there by you know putting him in his place. But you know, it's I always tell this to people, and I used to think that travel baseball and coaching, like I was like, you know what? If I put the best group of coaches together and we have the best knowledge base, you know, we're we're, we're the best, if not one of the best, in, you know, when it comes to teaching the game, teaching hitting, teaching base running you know, teaching them how to play hard in between the lines, do everything right. Everybody's going to want to play for us. Everybody's going to want to do that. And, and yes, we do play for the NA Bulls and people want to play for us already anyway. Um, But at the end of the day, and this is going to be brutally honest and um, for most people, and you know this, Adam, but parents really don't care about that stuff. They don't care about the coach being an elite. They don't care about winning, you know, a ton of games. Like, do they want to win? Yes. Is, does it matter if you go 45 and five? No, it really doesn't. Because at the end of the day, all the parents, all they care about is you patting their son's ego and patting their ego. Like that, I also, and it's sad to say, like all they care about is them thinking that their kid is going to be the next D1 athlete or them thinking that their kid is better than everybody else. Like it is unfortunate that I have to say this. Uh, and this isn't every parent, obviously. There are the parents, like I get parents that come up to me every year and say, thank you for treating my son like a man and, and holding him accountable and pushing him to another level that he wasn't aware of. Like I, I have conversations like that all the time. I've got multiple Bulls guys in the in the minor leagues and in their first round draft picks. They'll shoot me a text, say, hey, coach, thank you for everything. Like that's the cool stuff. That's the awesome stuff that makes everything that I do worth it. But the real, the, the ugly, you know, realistic situation of travel baseball is the majority of people just want their egos padded. That's, that's what it is. They just, they want to feel good about themselves. You know, they could be hitting 200, but if you tell them they're a division one baseball player, they're like, hey, dude, I got 50 K's and hundred ABs. It doesn't matter. This coach said I'm playing D one, bro. So like that, that's, that's their mindset. And, um, I, I think us as coaches and as a society, the only way for it to change is kind of like, you know, people talk about uh, political correctness and I'm not going to get into politics. I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy for those that are listening, but essentially like, you know, you only allow um, people to control what you say if you allow them to control what you say and you can say whatever you want. Obviously you don't want to be offending people all the time, but you say what you want when you want, as long as you're respectful when it comes to the travel baseball world, don't let the outside society or don't let players and and parents control how you run things. Like if you have a certain way, if you believe in telling the truth, when you make a commitment to a team, it's over. Like if, if another organization was approached by a parent and this parent was like, Hey, we want to play for you. Like we really want to play for you instead. We made this commitment to the other team. Can we play for you instead? If that organization was like, Hey, you know, I would love to have your son play for us. But one of two things has got to happen. If you already committed to them, you need to play for them. And if you've, um, if you don't want to play for them, you need to ask for a release. You need to ask if you, if it's okay for you to go play for another organization. If we all did that together, it would make everything so much better. Uh, there would be, there would be more respect amongst um, organizations with each other. Yes, we compete with the, for the same players when it comes to a recruiting standpoint. But if we all abide by the same rules 
and we're not, you know, calling kids and offering them scholarships under the table or saying, Hey, I'm going to get you recruited. Like there's certain organizations around here um, where they're saying that, Hey, you guys, they don't do a good enough job recruiting. We guarantee we're going to get you a division one scholarship or we guarantee we're going to, we are going to work harder for you. That's, this is the new thing is a lot of coaches are saying, Hey, we're going to get you, we're going to work for your scholarship. We're going to get it for you. And people that are listening right now, that's not how it goes. Like we, we do nothing. Like we tell them exactly what we see. We open their eyes and kind of guide them through the process. But at the end of the day, it's the player's ability and tools and how he performs physically, mentally, emotionally, that is going to get him that scholarship. It has nothing to do with us saying, Hey, this kid's a D one player. And they're going to take us no matter what. Cause as soon as we were wrong about one player, that university or that college is never going to come ask us that question again. Cause they knew we were BSing about a certain player. Um, but yeah, you're right, man. When it comes to the loyalty factor, it's, it's, it's a really tough situation with, with organizations, poaching kids, um, you know, parents and players, like maybe they had one bad game or one bad, you know, uh, practice, or they didn't like something a coach said. Um, and they're immediately wanting to go somewhere else. And it's, it's like that in the real world too. Like, you know, we were just talking about the podcast the other day, just because that we don't see eye to eye on everything doesn't mean that I automatically hate somebody. It's, just, you know, if we don't see eye to eye on something, it's just like, all right, no big deal. But you know what? We do see eye to eye on this. Um, but it's, it's, it's a tough situation. I think if more and more people view it the way that we do it and try to do things the right way, make sure honesty, integrity, and character are big, huge core values of every organization. Um, I think change will change. It won't change immediately, but it'll change over time because sooner or later parents and players will start figuring it out. And, you know, just like, you know, word is the best marketing tool, you know, you know, word of mouth is the best marketing tool. Word of mouth is going to help change the atmosphere of, of travel baseball as well. Um, and lastly, before um, I pass it on to you, Adam, it's like, you know, another thing that irritates me is these travel baseball organizations, like everybody's trying to put their name on a kid. They're trying to poach and say, hey, this is our kid. Um, yeah. Whether he play, he could have played one weekend for a travel team organization. They're saying, oh, this is a uh, this is a uh, this is our guy. Hashtag this is our guy right on, on social media. And they're, they're trying to stake claim on kids. And yes, if he played for you while he got that college scholarship offer, yes, hundred percent say this is a college guy that played for, you know, say for instance, the bulls, but if he was playing for another organization, when he got that college offer, that, that is, there's no right. I don't see it. It's right at all for a kid to, for that organization to try to claim that player. Um, we had a kid that played for us for like three, four years. And another organization uses literally still tweets about him to this day. Yep. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's to me, it's bad business. It looks bad. It's not good. Um, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes in the future and see if everybody starts changing and understanding the difference between what's right and wrong. But, uh, anything else you want to touch on with that? Yeah. I mean, I love the idea that you brought up of the release thing that makes so much sense from a standpoint of, I think we're going to kind of police all this chaos that's going on and all that stuff will get taken away. And it's such a, it's a professional manner. And cause it is a big deal. Like you don't want to be known as the one that jumps from team to team team like even coaches will ask if they see that you've played on three teams in three years they're going to say what's the issue here and they might not say it to you but they're going to ask guys that have been around you because that's been known as hey this is third team in thir three years is he the problem does he think everybody else is the problem like what's going on because if he was happy then he'd be staying there obviously so now it's just raising red flags that you don't need to be brought up on you and then you really got to understand why did I just leave to you now have these red flags yep. so I love that release idea and I think what you were just saying there too is if a hitter walked in and used our cages one day at high school heater LT we can't claim that kid he came in he hit and he did whatever like <laughs> he's not ours we didn't really work with him ever now he's <laughs> one of ours that in there training back and forth and he's there every every once a week twice a week whatever it is like yeah that he is a part of our organization but so many people are so fast to stake claim on kids and it does suck to see because it's so funny. I'll share messages back and forth with Knights guys when I see another organization tweet about a kid that they picked up to take down the Fort Myers or something like that. And it's like, yep. oh, yeah, guy, and this is how many guys we've had drafted. And it's well, no, he played with you. He wore your jersey one time. He didn't fully huh. play with you and he probably didn't, he didn't pay fees. He didn't pay money. He's literally picked up because he's a really good player. And y'all just said, Hey, where are uniform for the weekend? And now we state claim to him. So it's such a crazy world out there. And, and like you said, it's getting almost more out of control each and every year. And I think that release player would be such a good starting point of, yeah, we're not making these guys got signed contracts, but at the same time, kind of like, when college baseball went to where they all used to be four year scholarships where they changed it, it was year to year. So that way that coach holds you responsible. If you're not holding up to your end, he can take it away or he can do anything from that standpoint. So I think it could be said both ways where if an organization sees a player and they're like, 
hey, we don't really like what you're doing. Like, we're not going to invite you back. I know being with the Knights for the first time last year, we got a message in our group, whole coaches group meeting, basically just saying, is there two or three kids on your team that you coached this summer that you would recommend us not inviting back? If so, put them on. If there aren't any, perfect. Then you don't have to re reply anything. I just thought that was super cool on their end to try to kind of clean out their dirty laundry and get mm -hmm. rid of some trash maybe that they didn't want around because there was probably an issue. Because they didn't mention anything about were his stats good enough. They just mentioned was he a problem or yeah. was he late? Did he not show up? Was he not dependable? That kind of stuff that, hey, we're going to try to clean it up and see if we can get some better blood in there. So, Yeah, absolutely. And and. and Kids jump ship and parents jump ship just because they, they maybe, you know, they, they don't they don't like the coach or then maybe they get into it with the coach. And, you know, you know, part of being uncomfortable is, is a part of that growth. You know, you have to be uncomfortable in certain situations. You're not going to like everything your coach does. But if you believe in the coach, you believe in the organization, I guarantee good things are going to happen. Um, but kind of to transition, this is actually a great transition to our next topic because yeah. um, it's gonna, it kind of flows in with one another is dealing with bad coaches. Um, you know, it could be at the high school level. Um, could be instructors at the same time. It could be your travel baseball coach, but I've had some conversations with a lot of my kids lately about coaches. And I, I will say this about kids, kids are listening. Parents are listening. Like if you complain about a coach all the time, um, then I know you could probably complain about me or complain about other people too. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like it's okay to say, I, I'm kind of confused about why coaches doing things and, and it's okay to be upset every now and then. But like, if you're complaining all the time, uh, that you got to check yourself in the mirror and kind of see where you're coming from because, you know, negativity feeds negativity. Um, so be aware of what situation you're in, but there are certain situations where you have some, some bad coaches. And when it comes to bad coaches, it could be a person that maybe doesn't know the game and um, is very egotistical about it um, and doesn't really try to help. Um, there could be an old school guy that is literally not wanting to do anything new school at all, uh, not kind of grow with the game at all. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't consider that like a lot of these, I wouldn't consider complete bad coaches, but to me, any coach that's not trying to be the best at what they do, I, th I would consider that bad. Um, and there could be a coach that is very condescending, um, very negative. It's just a bad dude in general. Doesn't really teach character, has bad character, basically tells you to live to a certain standard and he doesn't live to those standards. And I've seen a lot of coaches like that, um, as well, but we're kind of got to touch on all these right here. But, um, I had a conversation with a kid the other day. And he was basically saying, Hey coach, like my, my, my high school coach, he's not my head coach, but he, I was doing a drill that you do. And, and it's a drill that's really helped me a lot. And he walked over and goes, Hey, this is, this is dumb. Like you're not going to do this. This is stupid. Like, I don't like the, like the way your swing looks like for this. Um, you're not ever going to do this. And I go, well, did you ask him why? And he goes, well, no, I kind of was, uh, I was kind of scared. I didn't know how, how to act in the situation. Cause he just was very adamant about not being, not being a good drill. And I go, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to ask the question why. Um, so that way you can figure out what he's going on. Cause it's, it's okay to have a different opinion from an instructor as a coach, but if you're communicating with kids and you tell them, no, like they're not five years old, you got to explain to them why, like it's not a kid trying to get into the cookie jar um, at your house. Like you've got to explain like why, why you don't like this. Or here's another thing. Like, why don't you ask a question? Like, Hey, what are you trying to do right there? What is this helping mm -hmm. right there? Uh, Cause we talk about all the time with drills and stuff. Like I never say there's a, there's never a bad drill. There's always, there's, there's always, there could be bad concepts to a drill. There's a bad meaning behind the drill. Um, but you know, with every single drill, like I've done some weird, weird drills with certain guys that would, that worked really well that I would never do with probably 80, 90% of my guys just cause I needed to. Um, like I, I, there's a specifically one person um, I'm thinking of right now. She uh, gets, um, she never gets full extension or swing. So we literally work on hitting the tire at full extension and it helps her stay through the ball. Um, and we're just, we're practicing getting extension at contact, even though we're not going to get extension at contact, it just helps her stay through it. Um, but kind of Adam, kind of what's your experience and, and, and maybe something similar to that situation of a coach, like maybe he looks at a drill that you've done that one of your kids is doing in the past or, you know, coaches that have a tendency of saying, Hey, this drill's stupid. You're going to do our thing. Like, uh, what well, kind of, what's your opinion on that? Cause I know a lot of coaches get stuck in their ways and they do the same five drills every year and nothing ever changes. Yeah. And I think every baseball player out there, even including us, like we've played for bad coaches before. It's just part of it. And unfortunately it's kind of just like anything in life. You have to kind of just deal with it. So the best thing to do is like you said, ask questions and try to interact with them and Tell them why it helps you if they don't have any answers for you. Well, this is why I'm doing it. Like, have you ever thought about doing it? And maybe they probably never have because they've probably never seen it. So 
uh, yeah, there's been some stuff that happens where like there was a kid coming in the other night that he's been hot and he had one off game and I asked him like what his coaches said because I noticed right away his swing was it was rushed and it was a little different he would had not been hitting like that. And it was like within the first 15 minutes. So I kind of just asked him, Hey, what, what's going on? Like, what'd you change? He said, well, my coach told me that my foot's not getting down early enough. And I was like, okay. I said, so what happened? I explained like the situation. And he said, I struck out twice the other night against this guy. And he just said that my foot wasn't getting down early enough. So this guy was over exaggerating this hitter and getting it down super early. And so he was just yanking everything foul pretty much or yanking it, everything pull side. Cause he was so early. And uh, well, I asked kind of how everything went and he mentioned, well, at first, the guy was throwing like 62 miles an hour. I'm like, all right, so wait. You just told me that you weren't getting your foot down on time on 62. Like, I find that very hard to believe because I've seen you hit. Like, you hit off the hack attack all the time. And then his eyes kind of opened up like, yeah, you're right. I said, so basically, this coach just told you something. Basically, that sounds smart, is my opinion, is, hey, get your foot down because everybody, it's an easy thing to say. Keep your eye on the ball. Get your foot down. This kind of stuff. Throw your hands. Fix it. I'm just expecting these kids to work miracles. And so what we had to do was take that out of him, get him back to actually getting his foot up early and keeping it up and letting his swing land his foot. And all of a sudden he got locked right back into where he was. And then he had two or three doubles over the weekend and he's back to grooving again. And so it was a learning lesson for him to understand that, hey, maybe this coach, and this was, I think, freshman ball, maybe this freshman coach that's helping me out, maybe he's not as smart as a guy that studies this stuff all the time. And I've got to try to figure out a way to – kind of take what he's saying with a grain of salt and just be respectful about it. But know in my head, my foot was not getting down late off 62 miles an hour. So that's not what the issue was. It was probably honestly too, like too early on it versus yeah. the other <laughs> way around if I had to guess. So it just kind of blew my mind. Another one was a coach that was telling the kid he was overstriding. So he came in and was literally, I don't even think he was striding and he's a leg kick guy. And it was, he was almost losing ground instead of gaining ground. And so he's standing straight up, looks like he's hitting a golf ball off the tee. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, my God, I'm striding too far, and that's just creating uh, my rollovers. And so we kind of just went back, reevaluated, reevaluated, watched some game film, and we're like, no, I don't think that's what the issue was. I think you were just catching the ball too far out in front of you. And, oh, okay, so I need to get back in my legs. Yes, you need to get back into your legs. That's your strong yeah. point. And then he goes out and he has a successful game the other night. So what you've got to understand is, like, when it comes to, especially with me and Sean, like other hitting coaches that do this for a living is – we study this stuff nonstop and we're looking at all the stuff. And if we don't have the answer for you, like I dang sure promise you, we're going to find the way to get an answer for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest thing. I wish these, what we talk like bad coaches or college coaches that maybe aren't very knowledgeable is like ask questions or interact with these kids or interact with their hitting coaches or interact with even just watching baseball and seeing what's going on. Cause there's a lot of good stuff. If you just watch MLB network, you might pick up on a few things like, Hey man, I saw this drill the other day that uh, Jim Tomo was doing on MLB network. I think it might really help you like just open your mind to all of this stuff. And, yep. and that's how you can become a better coach. Cause the ones that are closed minded and have always done it this way are the, the ones that you don't want to play for. And you're probably not having much success. And the team's probably not winning a lot. And I'm not saying bad coaches don't win because I played for coaches before. We had a dang good team. We almost kind of rallied around each other like, hey, screw this guy because we don't like him and we're going to play in spite of him and it actually works. So I'm not saying you have to be a good coach just to have winning records too. Same thing goes, you got the best coach in the world, kind of like you mentioned with the Bulls. You surround the best staff and you might not win. It's just part of it. You might mm -hmm. you have to have players and talent as well. So I think more than anything, it's like the best coaches in the world that I've been around know how to interact with everybody. And it's not just – we have to treat everybody the same. You got to figure out the person on the inside out first. And then that's how you know how to coach them. Just like if you're a teacher, you got to figure out what kind of student you're working with. And that's how you can kind of put a plan together and know, instead of just blurting out random information, like get your foot down or keep your head on the ball. Like that stuff. Yeah. It sounds cool. Cause you're acting like you know how to coach, but it really, it's not doing this kid. It's not helping this kid out. So that's, Unfortunately, it's a tough aspect and you're going to play for coaches like this. But like Sean said, though, like don't complain about this. Unfortunately, you can't like the more you complain about it, you're going to keep creating negative energy. And before you know it, like you're going to hate going to practice because all you do is complain about this coach you're playing for. So try to find a way to just kind of take this information out and go out there and play for your team. 
and not necessarily play for your coach. And so play for the guys that you're on the field with. And if y'all win and he takes all the credit, hey, it is what it is. Maybe as you move up in ranks, you'll get a better coach and, and you'll get to play for him one day. And you'll really appreciate playing for him because he'll care about you. So it's, it's a learning experience, just like anything in life. And you have bad teachers, you have good teachers. It's just whatever you perfect. And if a coach is hard on you, don't hate him because of that. A lot of the coaches that are hard on you, they're hard on you because they expect a lot out of you. And so don't just assume like I can never please this guy's. Hey, what's the reason he's being hard with me and have conversations with him. We talked about it before on the podcast of having one-on-one -on -one conversations with coaches. And I can imagine this player you mentioned was a little intimidated to ask why, because when you're 14, 13, like you don't ask a grown adult why, especially if he's your coach and he writes the lineup and he's one of these that, maybe he thinks he knows everything. It, it is kind of intimidating to ask why. So maybe not do that in front of everybody, but later today when you go up there and you kind of see him doing something before the practice starts, pulling him to the side and ask him like, hey coach, if you don't mind, like why don't you like me doing that drill? Or what is it about that drill that you don't like? And see what he has to say about it. So I think that's some ways you can go. But I think the biggest point, like you mentioned earlier, is just like as crappy as the situation may be, like try the best you can not to complain about it because then it's going to turn into a long season and you're just going to be miserable the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, talking about that coach, it's funny that you say you gave that example about the coach saying, hey, his foot, your foot is not getting, not getting down in time, so we need to get down earlier. And I remember there was a, a coach, um, actually, I, I know him really well, but he was telling this kid, one of my kids I train, he's like, Hey, he's making, he's swinging. His dad was saying the same thing. He's like, he's way late. Like he's so late. You know, we got to get his foot down earlier. And then I was watching every swing and, and on video from the game uh, of them coaching him. And this is the, this is kind of the, you know, the catch 22 with lessons is you're teaching a kid something and, and it could be really helping and really building them up. And all of a sudden he's getting something completely different from a coach or from the parent. It can really jack him up. And I was watching because the kid was hitting in BP. This was, I think, two summers ago. Uh, kid was hitting in BP. And I was throwing live, doing leg kick, throwing in curveballs, sliders, a little bit of everything. And the kid was hitting really well. And the next weekend, all of a sudden, like they're telling me that he's super late on the ball, can't see the ball and, and freaking out. And so, I, like I was saying, I was watching the video. And this dude had his foot down so early that he was swinging. The ball was 10 feet in front of him still. And these guys yeah. were telling him that he was late. I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and, <clears throat> and I kind of found out and I started asking questions. I'm like, I wasn't there, so I can't comment on this. But I go, I'm going to take a wild guess that you faced a hard-throwing pitcher on the first game of the weekend. And maybe he fouled some balls off and missed him. And the answer was, yeah, 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 he did. I go, this, was that the hardest guy – the hardest throw for the entire, the entire weekend. Yeah, it was. I go, what, what about the rest of the guys? Well, they, they were average speed to, to below average. So you got in this kid's head that he had to get his foot down so early instead of just saying, hey, let's start a little earlier. Let's be yeah. smoother. Let's slow this guy down. Now you're saying, let's get your foot down early. So as soon as you drop down 10 mile an hour on the fastball, this kid's swinging 10 feet in front. The ball's 10 feet in front of him. <laughs> and that's the thing is like for coaches, it's like, None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. Um, I always call these guys the non-communicators. Like the, they'll just throw in of, hey, get your foot down early. Or like the old school, like the old school guys pitching, they'll yell, bow your neck. Like random things like that. Like they, these guys have this old mindset of like, there's always, you know, three or four answers to every single problem. And like for me, if anybody's telling you you're not getting your foot down in time, it's, there's nothing wrong with saying that. But you got to be aware of what the pitcher is how he's throwing, uh, what, what's the kid doing? Like a lot of people think, and like getting the foot down in time, as you know, Adam, like a lot of time it has to do with the hands of the upper half too. If the upper half's not in sync, like the timing is going to be off. So there's a lot of factors, but this coach specifically, like, and that's why I tell players, like guys are listening right now. Like it is okay to ask why it is okay to ask questions. Like there are going to be bad coaches that, that do not communicate. They just tell you yes or no and, and leave it at that. But you've got to understand like, the only way for you to become a better player is you have to know the X's and O's. You can't be a guy that just, you can't be a robot. The guy I'm going to tell you right now, every single time I coach these guys in the summertime um, that act like robots, like they don't understand why we go to certain places for bunk coverages. They don't understand why we're doing double cuts at certain times. Um, like they don't understand where to go. Like the reason of why or where you're supposed to go, that's why they screw it up. If you coach kids mm -hmm. to be robots, they're just like, okay, so if there's a, if this person's here, I'm going to go to this spot instead of saying, oh, maybe I'm covering this back because nobody's going to be there. Maybe that's why I need to be going there. Maybe, maybe as a third baseman, I'm reading this bunt hard or soft because I, somebody's got to be able to fill the ball. Otherwise it's going to be a single every single time. Like there's so many, there's so many factors that kids like, you know, when it comes to bunt coverages or drills or stuff that they just, 
they just they just do and there's no actual thought process behind it. it it can really affect them but to kind of go into the next part um with the non-communicators or the guys like you were talking about it and touched on it is is kids that get very very upset or coaches being hard on them um and i use this quote all the time if your coach is hard on you good like it's a good situation you, you that coach cares about you now if a coach is calling you names and and, and, you know, and like yelling at you and making you run every five seconds. I was talking about running the other day um, on social media. Like, you know, I believe like running is disciplinary action. Like you need to do it every now and then. But if it's something being done every single day and it's just like the guy's just spewing like, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that. He's never happy. Like me and Adam played for a guy that was never happy. It didn't matter uh, as long as we could have played the best game in the world. If we lost, we, we sucked. Like we were the worst players on the, in the world. And, you know, there are coaches that are like that. The co coaches that are like that, they win a lot of games. Um, but you've got to understand there's, there's a difference between belittling a player and trying to get the best out of you. Um, if you're making mental errors and mental mistakes, do you, do you deserve to get yelled at or deserve somebody to get on your ass? Hell yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I use this quote and it's, it's like, I would rather hurt your feelings than hurt your future. And mm -hmm. with, with young guys, like you can't go through a sport and you can't go through it without a coach getting on you. Like you need your coach to be on you and hold you accountable. If you made a mistake, doesn't matter if you have an excuse. If you made a mistake, let that coach get on you. Listen to what he has to say. Listen to the actual message. And when it's over, boom, it's done. Now, the other side of that, if there's a coach that gets on you about something, he's always got a negative mood to you or negative attitude toward you. And he's not um, like usually if you have a situation or a, 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 you make a bad mistake, a mental error, or you did something wrong, the coach gets on you that coach should be cool. It should act as if it never happened again. Like that, that's how the coach should act. If there is a coach that allows his personality to be affected, um, you know, day to day. And he's, you know, it's kind of a dick all the time. And, he, and like his personality, if he's in a bad mood, like you got to steer clear, like walking on eggshells, that's, that's a bad coach. Uh, I'll give you an example. And I won't use a name because I don't want to affect, and there might be people that actually like this dude, but I played, I actually played for a guy uh, a long time ago. Um, I don't know if I'll go on the, on the level or not. Maybe I will. I don't know. I don't care. I don't like the guy. So I, it doesn't matter. I won't use his name though. So this, anybody that knows me, like I'll give you guys an example. So you could, you could relate to this. I was respectful to the guy until he would lie to me, but anybody that knows me, I hustled all the time. Like I would bust my ass all the time. Like whether it's the weight room in between the lines, whatever I did, everything I could to give everything I got every single play, every single inning. Well, I was in a, we were in a scrimmage. And I ran out to left field. I was, I was playing left field at the time. And this coach just yells at me purposely trying to embarrass me um, and says, I walked to left field. And to me, like integrity and honesty is such a big deal to me. And I immediately called him like, no, I, I ran the whole time. And he starts lying and, and saying, no, I saw you walk the whole time. And this was right after an injury. Um, and this is right after I was, I did a lot of, you know, I did a lot of bitch work when I had the injury, I was doing a lot of things, which no big deal. I was injured. I needed to help the ball club. If they needed me to do what I needed to do and do field work and maintenance and work on the paint the bases, that's what I was going to do is what it is. But I started playing and this guy was purposely trying to be hard on me. He had Napoleon syndrome. So he had some issues with it when it comes to like, you know, um, influence on players and controlling situations and controlling his environment. And so he lied and, and kept yelling. And then our head coach kind of got on me and started saying that I was walking too. And so I wasn't going to let it go. I was arguing back and forth and this guy's screaming at me and laughing at the same time that I was that saying that I was walking, trying to create this atmosphere and trying to basically attack my character that I wasn't running to my position. Um, so I kept arguing back and forth. And finally the head coach was like, All right, you got to run polls. And so I started running polls um, and he said something like, Hey, you can, you can admit that you did this or you can run like, oh, I'm a run. And so I took <laughs> off, you know, and, and still to this day, and this guy did a bunch of other things that I don't respect him to this day. He's actually coaching a division one program right now. And anybody that ever asked me about him, I will tell them exactly like the guy's character is absolute piss poor. It's terrible. I will, I will always be honest. I'm like, Hey, if you want to go to that school, dude, awesome. Go for it. But I'm going to let you know what this coach is all about. And he had integrity issues. A guy had uh, out, you know, when he was at home, he had issues. I've heard other coaches talk about him and say so many negative things about him. It wasn't just me, but you know, I was a young guy, young man. And this coach was talking 
down to me and lying about me and, 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 and any coach that tries to like what he was trying to do. And, and I think in his own weird twisted way is he was trying to light a fire under me and piss me off. Cause he thought maybe that was going to make me better. And he's trying to like, Hey, I have control over you. So like, if you don't give me 110%, um, you know, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to play for me type thing or you're not going to start or whatever. That was the type of attitude that he had. Um, I think he was just trying to control the situation and show who's boss. Um, and in reality, like I would have rather been like, Edgar, let's go outside. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll handle this. We'll handle this a different way, but I've never would treat a coach like that. Obviously that was just in my head and in my mentality. Cause it doesn't matter what the coach is. You're going to run into guys and most coaches are awesome. They're honest. They'll, they'll be up front with you, but you get coaches that are like that, that are dishonest. They'll lie to you. They'll lie about you. You'll say negative things about you. I hope to God that people that are listening are affiliated with coaches like that. Like I said, it's, that's, a, that's a very small, minuscule percentage. I had another coach uh, that was a freshman coach at our high school um, that was really, really virtue signaling and really trying to talk about how great he is. And the guy ended up getting arrested a couple months later for um, some pretty messed up stuff. I, I, don't, I won't say on air, but um, I remember him ripping on me because he said I was too cocky and too arrogant and I needed to be humble and uh, treat, you know, treat, treat the game with more respect, stuff like that. And this guy ends up getting arrested and goes thrown in jail for five years. So you're going to run into people that are like that. What you've got to understand is you need to take the high road. You need to be respectful. If somebody's lying about you, you say, Hey, do it. If somebody's going to give you a disciplinary action, um, if they're going to make you run polls or whatever you need to do, you do it. If there's a rule where if you show up one minute late and you got to run for it, it doesn't matter if your car broke down or somebody hits you, you do it. It's a part of the rules. It's a part of the process. Um, you got to understand that at the end of the day, your character is what's most important and how you're going to be as a man is what's most important. Is that coach going to affect you long-term? No. Is that coach going to um, make, it, make it a living hell for you? Most of the time, probably not. You might have to deal with them in certain situations, but understand when you, when you get coaches that are like that, just avoid those guys, be respectful, do what you need to do, bust your ass, good things are going to happen. Um, but that's, I kind of wanted to touch on that cause I know there's some situations with some coaches and, and the other way around too, there are some coaches that have to deal with some bad kids, um, that, that necessarily maybe their drug issues and something along those lines. So it goes both ways as well. Like you got to have some character and lay down the line, lay down the law and be respectful as possible on both sides. But I kind of wanted to give that example. I don't know if you've ever had anything like that before, Adam, but that was, uh, that was just something that came to my head. And people always ask me about that guy because <laughs> he like people, he's recruiting players and stuff. And I, I'm just upfront and honest about him because I want to make sure players understand what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. It's unfortunate, man, that these, some coaches look at players like they're chess pieces. And like you said earlier, like they own you. And mm-hmm. that's what the worst part about it is. And I see like those elite, those top great coaches, like, all they talk about is the player uh, is the person first and then the player comes second and they have so, so so much success that way because the coaches that get stuck the other way around don't last long or they're not successful and they wonder why it's because this is how they view things they live and die by every little thing that player does on the field performance wise versus everything else that comes with it so i didn't have anything like that fortunately for myself uh, i will touch a point here is my junior college coach uh, coach Wayne Larker was probably playing for him I thought he was the hardest coach that I had played for and I remember at the time like I didn't like him very much and like Mm -hmm. we talk about it all the time to this day I didn't like him very much it was two years after the fact that I realized how much he meant to me and like how much he taught me and how much discipline was involved and like he was the best coach I ever had now and I'll sit here and say that and it's just so funny that maybe not at that right time here I am thinking like dang I'm playing two years at this junior college for a coach that is just riding me and he's hard on me and he's suspending me for missing breakfast check or I don't get to play the day because I was late to the bus or I was caught wearing my hat backwards in the cafeteria. That's against his rules. Only catchers can wear his hat backwards. Like, look, I got it. I used to think like these rules are the stupidest thing ever, but what did it teach me later on in life was how important it is to be on time, to be punctual, to do these things. And that's why I feel like I'm like I am today is because of that discipline I had early on. Did I miss out on some games? Oh, of course I did. One of the worst moments was my brother and dad were coming to watch us play at the university of Mobile. And I wasn't on the bus because I got suspended for being late to breakfast check. And mm-hmm. so having to call my dad and brother and be like, uh, by the way, like I'm not going to be at that game today. And then to hear it from them, I'm just like, man, this guy really makes me mad. Like this is bull yep. crap. Like I'm here to play baseball. I'm not here to do all this other stuff. 
And then later on in life, now I understand, and we still talk about it to this day. And every player I've ever met that I talk with about, like Coach Larker is one of our favorite coaches that at the time you really didn't understand why he was doing things. But later on in life, you completely understand. And it was about preparing the person and not the player. And so I love to give him props there on that standpoint. But, no, I'm glad I didn't have that situation that you had, man, because it would have been frustrating to have a guy straight up try to lie to you or lying to everybody and calling you out to try to light a fire. It's, it's the stupidest thing I ever heard. And like you said, some coaches have weird tactics. They think some things are going to work. And I just I just I've never really been into the big rah rah to try to get somebody sparked up. Like mm-hmm. I shouldn't have to as a coach be getting you amped up to play a game like no, that's not my job. If you're not here with enthusiasm and ready to play or you're not coming to the weight room to work out or hit excited, like, it's not my job to get excited for you. Like, this is your career, buddy. Like, go do something else if this isn't what you want to do. So that's a note to your players is, like, don't go to a coach or play for a travel coach or go to this college because, man, man, this guy really gets me pumped up. Well, like, what are you talking about? It gets you pumped up to, what, play baseball? Is he giving you, like, a big pregame speech or anything? <laughs> Yeah, like that stuff doesn't play. Maybe in locker rooms like football, because that's such a an egomaniac type of sport where you're literally going up against these monsters every day. Like, okay, I can see where that will get you a little cranked up, but you can't play baseball like this. So all the good players I've ever been around, they were not the big high energy rah-rah. I mean, they were the level-headed guys that never got too high, never got too low. And those are the ones that have success because this game is so hard. Mm. So players just kind of listen to this episode and think about some going on and evaluate and one thing the last thing I want to touch on is like players be honest so like there was a player a couple years ago that came in telling me hey the coach is trying to change my swing and we're going back and forth well what the player forgot to mention to me was he wasn't 100 percent totally honest with me so the coach does show up and props to the guy I I was he's one of three coaches that's ever came in there to like have hitting discussions and uh, I'm kind of going like hey man so what's going on here I hear there's like an issue and he's like he shows me some video He's like, so are you trying to teach him to do this stuff? And I'm right away like, no. Like, he's straight lunging at the ball. No, I'm not teaching him that. And then I look at the kid like, hey, why didn't you tell me that you're lunging at the baseball at practice? And he kind of looked at me like – because he was so used to blaming his coach for it as opposed to looking in the mirror and blaming himself. And so we both looked at each other and was like, promise you, coach, I'm not teaching me how to do that. Like, that is straight up wrong. And so now the player was, like, really embarrassed about it. But I told him, that's just how important it is to be honest. So be honest with yourself and be honest with each other about what's going on so we can all try to get on the same page to help you out. Yeah, I mean, that's a great story right there, understanding, like, accountability is everything. You, If you got a coach that is teaching you accountability and discipline, like – especially with you looking back, you reflecting on the situation. You appreciated him so much because at the time, like you were so involved, like, I just want to play. I just want to play. And, you know, I want to tear it up and not understanding like all the other things that he was trying to help you with uh, from a character standpoint and building you up. Cause there's going to be uncomfortable conversations. There's going to be situations where you don't like your coach at the time. Um, but like I said, like, yeah, if that coach has a short-term memory and doesn't like let things linger, that same thing with you, you shouldn't be letting things linger. And another example with that kid of like, you know, all the time you'll see kids trying to pit the instructor versus their head coach or an instructor versus a coach with each other. And instead it's like, you know, what's the issue here? Is it, is it more the kid? Like what's the, what, what's the one common denominator here right now? Like, you know, if you're doing something wrong, because at the end of the day, like I said before, 90%, 95% of coaches, they all are doing it for the right reasons. They, they mean, well, they're trying to help. They're trying to live, learn and pass on. They're trying to do the right thing uh, and help treat, you as a young man or help build you into a man um you know that five percent that are in it for just winning or you know whatever their their selfish reasons are like you get through those guys you deal with those guys you know you get used to dealing with them now because you're gonna have to deal with people like that in the real world it is what it is um i sit back do i do i look back at that situation on that coach um and do i think about that every day hell no do I look back on it and think about it as motivation on what not to do as a coach, on motivation on, on, on how to become a better coach myself? Yes, I'll look at that all the time because that's a situation that I learned from. And I, and, I, and I saw a coach trying to use psychology that didn't know anything about psychology that was a very insecure uh, guy that was trying to act out and pretend to be something he's not. And that's the one the advice that I'll leave with here is, as coaches is, you know, whatever your personality is, like, that's how you've got to be. You can't pretend to be something you're not like, you know, if you're laid back, you're a calm, cool, collected dude, you know, be that guy, uh, be that influential guy. Like if you, if you know your stuff and you show that you care, kids are going to buy into that. If you are a high energy guy, which I am on the same page with you, Adam, like you can't be too high and too low in this game. Like, you know, I had a kid one time 
uh, when I was coaching uh, at the high school, uh, strength and conditioning coach, and the kid goes, you don't motivate me to work harder. And I go, I literally looked him in the eye and go, that's not my job, kid. Like if I have to yeah. motivate you, then you're, you're already failing. Like it's not my job. My, my job is to make you better. If I make you better, I'm doing my job. And, and, and I think that's something that's a, that's a misconception, just like with, with travel baseball, a lot of parents nowadays are thinking this coach is going to get me a scholarship and kids look to coaches for motivation. And that's just not, that's just not how it is. Like, you know, dis like, and you hear Goggins and, and, and Jocko Willink and all these guys talk about, you know, motivation is for, is for what they would say is for the sissies. Like, you know, discipline is what lasts forever. You get in because you're going to have days where like, I get days where I'm motivated. I feel like I could work. I'm, I'm Superman. I feel like I can work 12 hours and kill it. Mm-hmm. And then there's days I don't want to do anything. It's the discipline that's, that saves me. And that discipline that saves me was instilled and helped me with um, tons of coaches I had growing up, helping teaching that discipline with me. My dad and my mom helping teaching that discipline with me. Like those are the things those coaches are trying to help you. And that discipline is ultimately what, what makes you who you are and helps you become successful in life. So guys, like uh, we're kind of going to finish out right here. Um, I love this episode because it's, it's kind of, it's real world stuff. It's, 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 it's stuff that like people actually deal with day to day. Um, so if you're having trouble with your coach, um, you know, if, if you, if you're like, oh, this guy's a bad coach or, you know, something's going on, why don't you ask some questions? Why don't you get behind it? Why is like, coach, you know, why were you hard on me in this situation right here? Coach, why do you not like this drill? Um, you know, and Adam talked about this. This was about a month ago in a podcast talking about going in and talking to his coach in pro ball. And it kind of changed the atmosphere and changed the whole, the whole clubhouse. Like, you know, communication is, is the key to success that uncomfortable communication and with the conversations you don't want to have, those are the conversations you need to have most because those are conversations that's going to help you in the long run. But anything else you want to touch on before we roll out? No. And guys, just try to learn anything you can from any coach that's ever involved in your life. Pick one or two things that may help them out. It doesn't have to be all these different types of things like, Hey, one or two things that you can learn on later in your life. Cause you never know one day you may be working for a boss that you think is a bad boss, but what are you going to do? You can complain about it. No, you have to work to make a living out of it. So you better get used to how to handle these situations. So we talk about it all the time. We're life coaches, not just baseball coaches. So this was a fun one, man. I really enjoyed doing this one. Yeah, for sure guys. Well, if you guys enjoyed this episode, make sure you guys leave that five-star review, please like, and share uh, the podcast. Um, we'll get rolling here soon. I know we want to do a weighted ball episode. I asked Adam about doing that here soon because people ask questions about that, but we'll get that organized and get that out to you guys as soon as well. Um, but until next time, guys, we'll see you guys later.